Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. This is, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a terrific gathering of folks who share a lot in common, and I'm really, really excited to tell you this particular story. I love telling the story because uh, we don't talk about this world enough. We don't talk about agriculture or the farming world. And there's some amazing things happening in innovation, in innovative business models, and in customer development in the farm world. And so the story I'm going to tell you today is a case study in Sense and Respond. It's a case study on business model innovation. And like any good story, um, it has the following elements. It has six acts. I'm going to get those through those six acts in 25 minutes, so they're short acts. Um, it has a hero. Every story has a hero. It has an empire, the evil empire, the enemy of the hero, perhaps. And then ultimately, like every good story, uh, there is an unlikely ally who appears at the end to help the hero manage their dilemma. Now, throughout the course of this particular presentation, I'm going to be using a particular framework that most of you, if you practice Lean Startup, will find familiar. It's called the hypothesis statement. Now, You'll see where this comes in over the course of the talk, but what we're going to do as I tell you this story is we are going to fill in the blanks for this hypothesis statement. Now, you remember every good hypothesis statement begins with we believe because we live in a world of uncertainty, and so we do not know. We simply believe. That's our best guess. We believe that meeting a specific user need with a specific set of features will create some kind of a business outcome, and we will know that we're right when we see some kind of evidence, right? Lean startup encapsulated in a statement. It's the hypothesis statement. So with that, on to Act 1. Act 1, or the user need, also known as the brutal economics of wheat farming. Yeah, didn't think you'd hear about that today, I bet. So we want to meet our hero. Our hero is a humble farmer struggling to eke out a living in a hostile environment. It's not that guy, unfortunately, but it is these guys. These are the, in this case, the farmers of the American Midwest. These are folks who work day in and day out to feed the United States and to feed the world, and this is the environment in which they work. Now, if you know anything or nothing about wheat farming, I will share with you a few key things to know about wheat farming. First and foremost, farmers do not market wheat. They do not place ad words about their wheat crop. There are no billboards on Interstate 70 as you cross through Nebraska that say, wheat, it's what's for dinner. None of these things are in the control, in fact, in the hands of the farmer. In fact, the market doesn't even consider how much it costs to produce wheat when determining the price of wheat. The only thing that the market cares about is how much wheat is needed, right? What's the demand and how much the consumer will pay. That's it, completely out of the farmer's hands. Now, here's the dilemma in this particular case. At any given moment, at any given moment, a farmer can easily have millions of dollars in seed and labor in the ground at tremendous risk. There's a tremendous amount of risk to all of that seed, fertilizer, labor that's in the ground. There's timing, there is floods, there are insects and pesticides, there are weird crop circles that sometimes come up and perhaps ruin your crop that you've spent so much time and effort to put in the ground. Now, the thing to take away is that the average, in this case, the math that we did for this particular presentation was in the American uh, ecosystem, but I'm sure it applies relatively the same across most countries. The average American wheat farmer has a farm size of about 438 acres. And out of that 438 acres, the total profit, the total profit when we wrote this talk about six months ago, the total profit from a wheat harvest is $2,409. So you're putting in hundreds of thousands worth of dollars worth of effort and, and, and product, and what you get out of it on average is $2,400. The margins are super, super thin. Now, when doing research for this talk, we learned a lot of really interesting expressions because I'm not a farmer. I've never been a farmer, my, I don't come from a family of farmers, but there's this uh, expression in English that says, rain makes grain. When it rains, the grain grows, right? But unfortunately, if you wait too long, if it rains too much, or if you wait too long, or if the ground is too wet, you end up with this thing called wheat 
with wet feet, right? So the wheat starts to rot. It's, there's fungus, and the wheat starts to rot, and you stand a chance of losing that entire crop. Now, remember, your profit margin is $2,400, right? So if you run any risk of timing, right, if you don't get the wheat out of the ground at the right time, you risk losing even that super thin margin. And the farmers that we talked to, when we wrote this talk, We're sensitive to this. This is a quote from one of the farmers that we spoke to. We tried to interview him about wheat farming and how to get, you know, I don't know anything about wheat farming. Tell me about it. He said, look, I can't talk to you guys right now. It's planting season. Let's talk after. Timing is absolutely critical to farming, okay? Wheat farming or any other kind of farming. So with that, let's recap our user needs, okay? We've met our hero. Our user needs lower costs right, because the margins are super thin. Our user needs more efficiency. The faster, the more efficiently uh, that I can farm wheat, the higher my profit margins. And most importantly, I have to obey Mother Nature's schedule. I cannot bend that because I have no control over that as a farmer. And so let's pop that into our hypothesis statement, right? We believe that uh, meeting cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns for customers is a good thing for us to shoot for as a company. Let's figure out how to do that. So the next thing is the business outcome. Act two, or as we say, meanwhile, back at headquarters, right? This is headquarters. I know it's not. It's not the headquarters. Look, we're talking about the farming industry and the people who make farming equipment and the people who support these farmers. And generally, it doesn't look like this. Generally speaking, it looks like this, believe it or not. Just a couple of product managers, designers, engineers, marketers working in an office trying to figure out how to build better products and services for these farmers. Now, if you know anything about farming, the most interesting company and the most innovative company in the farming space right now is John Deere. John Deere is literally the Harley Davidson of farm equipment. Farmers, particularly in the US, love John Deere. They have used it for decades. They proudly call themselves a deer farm. We're a deer operation. We're a green operation. We're a deer farm. And in fact, to prove it to you how loyal people are to this particular brand, and I challenge any of you to show loyalty for your brand like this, this is just a small sample of the things available for you on Google Image Search if you search for John Deere tattoos. And the thing that I would not recommend is scrolling any further down this particular page because it goes downhill very, very, very quickly. Look at the size of some of these things, right? People love this company. They absolutely love it. And for the right reasons, these are the coolest, the biggest, the baddest, the most technically sophisticated, the greenest machines out there, and they do amazing things. Right? It's, not, it's not just tractors that they build, right? It's not just these big green machines. It's this whole thing called precision ag technology. Right? Precision ag, John Deere makes all that stuff and the software that runs into it. These are a, sense, a suite of products and sensors and tools that automate this farm equipment. They do data collection. They link it up to GPS satellites. They ship all of that information to data centers. They do big data, uh, machine learning, crunching on it, and they feed that information back to the machines, not just to the farmers, so that you can increase the efficiency and the productivity and the profit margin of these particular farmers. Right? It's amazing. They build all of this stuff. And so they're a hardware company. At heart, they've been building hardware for 100 years, and they are also a software company. They're trying to figure out how to integrate software and hardware together in one place. They have thousands of people working on technology in the Midwest of the United States. They have an innovation lab in Silicon Valley, like everybody else, and they're trying to understand how to do this together. And to be clear, they do product discovery. They go and spend time on the farms. The people that we talk to inside the company who do design and engineering and IT and all of those things, they come from the Midwest, from farm country, because they understand these people and they understand the culture and the needs. Now, to drive this home, These tractors are not cheap at all, okay? If you're so inclined and you go to the John Deere website, you'll see that there's a tractor, a build-your-own tractor wizard. These are the starting price points for these tractors. So you're starting somewhere around $400,000, and when you're done customizing and adding all those uh, precision ag tools that I talked about, you end up close to a million dollars, somewhere around $900,000 for some of these machines, which is amazing. 
Right? It's incredible to think that a farmer could afford a $900,000 tractor to do the farming. Right? So what's the business problem here? Right? We've talked about the user need. What's the business problem we're trying to solve? Well, it turns out the brutal economics of wheat farming again impact John Deere. To generate a meaningful profit on a farm, you need a big operation. Those 438 acres are not enough to generate a meaningful living. A big operation means you have a big expense, right? The more acres you have to farm, the more it costs to do that in seed, labor, pesticide, etc. Now, the technology that I just started to show you helps farm larger areas with less labor. Now, here's the catch, right? Less labor means fewer farmers. And fewer farmers means fewer tractor sales. And this is a massive problem for John Deere. Equipment sales are down for them year over year over year. They're selling fewer and fewer machines because the machines can do more work. They can do it with less human interaction and they can cover more ground. So people don't need to buy them as often. And they're, they're high quality. They don't break down. And so for John Deere, it's time to rethink their business model, right? We've got hardware. We've got software. How do we start to sell a different kind of business model that utilizes those two things and, and makes us uh, profitable while maintaining a certain amount of loyalty from the farmers to the brand. And this is really where they're starting to turn to services. And they're trying to figure out how to sell and deliver digital services to farmers to help make them more successful in farming. So, what is the business need? Well, the business needs less reliance on equipment sales. This is critical for us to survive as a company, right? We need to protect our margins. We have to stay profitable. We've been in business over 100 years. And most importantly, because there is stiff competition in this space, we cannot alienate our customers. They already love us. It's ours to lose. Right? We cannot push them away. So back to our hypothesis statement, right? We've got uh, meeting cost and efficiency for the customer and timeliness concerns uh, with some kind of features. We don't know exactly what. We'll create less reliance on sales for us as a business, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. We're getting there, right? We're putting the pieces together. We're starting to put together the hypothesis statement. Let's talk about Act 3 the promise or the offer you can't refuse. Now remember, this is where we are right now. And we're trying to understand what to build for farmers. So, we've got these amazing machines. They farm a significant amount of land at higher productivity, at less effort, at less cost. In fact, the, uh, the farmer that we spoke to earlier, he said, look, I can farm 2,500 acres today easier and faster than 500 acres 40 years ago. Right? This is the problem that we're actually seeing. And in fact, I actually want to show this thing because it's super cool. I just found this. Right? These tractors do this, by the way. They drive themselves, which means that one farmer can actually run two machines at the same time based on GPS and self-driving technology. It's already happening in the fields. A farmer just simply pushes a button, the other tractor comes up, they load it up, it goes back to the farm, it comes back. It's absolutely amazing what can be done with this technology. And to get this technology, you have to buy the equipment. And when you buy the equipment, there's one catch, and it's the license agreement. Now, you just paid a million dollars for a tractor, and you own that hardware. But the license agreement that you sign when you buy that tractor is, says that you are leasing the software. You don't own the brains of that tractor. What you're actually getting is an implied license for the life of the vehicle to operate the vehicle. But you don't have access to that software. You can't modify it, and you can't do anything to that tractor without first accessing that software. And that's the license agreement that you have to sign in order to gain that kind of efficiency and automation and ultimately see your profit margins go up. So, let's talk about our product features. Well. We've got more efficient products, we want that. We've got more capable products that are learning, right? We've got uh, increases in services and services revenue. And then, of course, we have a license agreement as our feature as well. So back to our hypothesis statement. What do we have? We've got, we believe that meeting cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns with greater efficiency, capability, and a license agreement, right? We'll create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. 
How do we know we're right? right? Well, let's find out. Act four, in which our hero encounters a problem. Now look, I, to I told you earlier, you cannot wait to get the wheat out of the ground. You wait too long, you lose the crop, you lose the crop, you lose the margin, you lose all the investment. The wheat is ripe, it's time to harvest, but there is a problem for our farmer. He's stuck and we need to get him out of there. It's not really this problem so much, but uh, it's this problem. Tractor broke. Now normally, farmers who are uh, extremely self-reliant. They pride themselves on building a do-it-yourself culture. We fix it ourselves, we make it better, and then we get the work done, right? In this particular case, to fix the tractor, the only way that you can do that is by accessing the software, even if you just have to replace a part. And because you signed that license agreement, as a farmer, you are not allowed to access the software or work your way through that software or try to hack your way through that particular software, which means that you have to call a certified, authorized John Deere repairman to come to your farm and fix your tractor for you. Now, remember, you can't afford to wait. If there happens to be one where you live, that's terrific. But if you live in Great Falls, Montana, the closest John Deere dealer to you is 500 miles away. You're going to wait two or three days to get the farm, uh, to get the, the wheat out of the farm, right? What are you going to do? Your culture is one of self-reliance. Your culture is one of fixing things yourself and doing the work to farm the land, and yet you can't, right? Because trying to work your way through the software protections is illegal. And the question is, how can this be? You just paid 900 grand for your tractor. Why can't you fix it? And the answer lies in this 20-year-old rule, in the United States at least, called the DMCA, also known as the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Now, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was designed in 1998 to keep people from cracking the protection on DVDs and software. So people didn't want people pirating DVDs and pirating software, which, I, which made sense in 1998. But in the 20 years since then, software has permeated every aspect of our lives. There is software in every bit of technology, not just every bit of product, right? Every piece of hardware has it, from your phone to your coffee machine to your tractors and everything in between. And to modify that information, you need access to modify those devices, to fix them, to improve them, to hack them, to do something that maybe they weren't originally designed to do, you need access to the, uh, the, the diagnostic information, error codes, tools, and manuals, etc. And you don't get those from the manufacturer because they don't want you doing that because you signed a license agreement when you bought that piece of hardware with the software in it. Now, there used to be a time where if you bought something and you figured out how to get extra value out of it, that value was yours to keep, right? If you, built, you bought, you bought a, a mixer or, uh, and you turned it into a, kind of a paint spinning thing, right? That was yours to keep. Today, any extra value that gets delivered to that device belongs to the company because you signed that license agreement. And when you start to think about innovating your business model as your businesses start to scale up, as your business ideas start to expire, and you're looking to uh, build new business models to exploit as you move further, the question that I want to keep in the top of your mind at every step of the way is, are you solving user needs? or are you exploiting user needs, right? Because both of these will make you money. And the question is, which business do you want to be in, right? And this is the challenge for John Deere. Now, really quick, before we jump into the next act, it's a real, I, I, want to, I want to talk about um, the challenge of building products, services, and business models for humans, right? How do we know what actually works? How do we know that this is a good idea? How do we know that we should build this product? How do we know uh, that we should build a business around this? And the challenge of knowing is the challenge of humans, right? Everything we make, everything we sell, everything we deliver has to be used by people. And our best plans, our best laid intentions and designs for what this thing should do and how it should work, even if we animate those specific designs, we think it's going to work this way, right? When we actually put the thing in customers' hands, we get to see how humans will actually interact with it over time, right? 
And it's that culture and the context of that culture of the humans who interact with your product that ultimately determines whether or not your business model succeeds or fails or needs to be innovated. Because you can think that you have the best possible solution for solving specific problems, and as soon as you inject humans into that process, <laughs> you find out that you're wrong. Right? These are our assumptions. We make assumptions about how to solve a problem, how to build a business around it, but as soon as you introduce it to humans, you find out that you're wrong, and the cultural context of those humans determines whether this works or not. This is Massachusetts, in case you're curious, right? You're not going to tell a Massachusetts driver how to turn or where to stop, right? I don't care how many signs you put up there. I used to live there, right? The thing to remember here is that just because you made it one way, people will do the thing that makes the most sense for them. Culture trumps everything, right? So you've got an idea for a new business model. Terrific. We're going to sell services to farmers, but if it conflicts with their culture, it's not going to work. We've got to get our ideas into market quickly to see how the culture reacts and then to respond. So this is our hypothesis statement, and this is where we are at this point, right? We, we believe that meeting cost efficiency and timeliness with greater efficiency in a license agreement will create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. Let's go to Act 5, our evidence. How do we know that this works? Or as we like to say, our hero finds an unlikely ally. Remember our hero, the brave farmer, uh, the wheat is ripe, needs to be harvested, but the tractor is broken, we got to fix it, I can't get it, I can't fix the tractor because I don't have access to the software. Who are you going to call? Billy D. Williams. That's who you're going to call. You're not going to call this guy, you're going to call this guy, which is amazing. Ukrainian hackers sell black market code to crack John Deere tractors for U.S. farmers to solve this use case. You can go online and you can buy physical hardware devices, black market pirate devices to plug into your tractor that will help you bypass the security on that tractor so that you can fix it, so that you can farm the wheat, so that you can make your thin profit margin. And this is who is solving this problem for John Deere, is black market Ukrainian hackers with devices and cracked software that these farmers are downloading online and then installing in their tractors, violating their warranties, violating their license agreement, simply to get the job done, because they want to fix it themselves and they can't wait for someone to come to their farm and do it. And so the thing that I want you to take away is that no matter how confident you are in your business model, right, if you enforce a bad business model, if you enforce a bad policy, people will work around that policy because culture beats everything. The way that I want to work is the way I'm going to work, not the way that you tell me to work, or not, but I'm not going to work based on the limitations of the business model that you've imposed on me. So understanding that culture and understanding your customers and how their needs are being met and whether or not you want these folks to actually supply product to your customers is a really good question to ask as you start to get that kind of market feedback. And so the question then becomes, how does the story end? Because this is our hypothesis statement, right? We want to solve this business problem. We want to solve this customer need, right? We think this is the way to do it. And the evidence that we're seeing is that our farmers are downloading cracked Ukrainian software, right? Is this what we actually want? And the answer really ultimately is this. It's up to you. It really is up to you as, as entrepreneurs, as intrapreneurs, as product managers, designers, etc. right? What are you going to do in a situation where your business model is innovating? It's innovating ahead of the law, right? Technology moves much faster than the law. The laws are never going to keep up with the continuously changing nature of technology, right? Uh, as, you know, and as makers of products, you have to find the right balance between law and business models and customer experience and needs to build the best possible solution for your customers as well as for your business, right? Again, we will always be ahead of the legal constructs, 
right? The legal structures are simply, they, they don't move. The, the DMCA is 20 years old. It has not been updated. It doesn't make sense for a world of continuous deployment and continuous delivery. There are always going to be gaps that you, as makers of products, can take advantage of. And the question is, will you use those gaps to serve your customers or will you use them to exploit customers because both will make you money, right? Again, technology might be ahead of the law, but technology will never get ahead of culture. The way that your customers want to work is the way that they're going to work or live or do the things that they actually want to do. And you've got to understand that and build that into your business model innovation to see how that works. Because once again, when you enforce bad policy, people will absolutely work around that policy. And you can see that, particularly in the United States, there's this thing called the right to repair movement. This is a, uh, a bipartisan, which is a word we don't use in the United States anymore, but it's a bipartisan movement across states to allow people to fix their own stuff, right? Legis state legislatures are working with each other across party lines to give people access to their devices so they can fix them. There are things like the repair manifesto, let me fix my thing because it's smart, it saves energy, it teaches creativity, etc. There are sites like ifixit.org which collect user manuals for everything, so if you can't find it for your device, you can go here and get it, right? This is evidence, this is market feedback that says something is broken in our new business models when we integrate hardware and software together. And so the things I want you to take away from this talk, the things I hope that you take away, are uh, there's six things, very, very quickly, one for each act. First and foremost is this, no matter what you do, what you make, or how you deliver it, you are in the software business. It's the only way to scale, it's the only way to bring our product to a mass market and to increase the kinds of efficiencies and productivity gains that we're looking for. Now, software is amazing on every level because it helps us unlock new business models, which is terrific, right? Services models are great, but software also enforces policy. The way you write your code, the user experience that you build in, the interfaces that you build enforce the policies of your organization, right? And the culture of your users will always beat that policy. So if you've got conflicting polarities there, where you're trying to enforce one policy, but your users don't work that way, that's going to be a problem, and they're going to find a way to work around that. Feedback loops, getting your ideas into customer hands, help you reveal that culture and understand where the challenges are and how to move your business model forward, right? And ultimately, if you take a look at your company and you can frame your success in user-centric terms, that will always help you determine whether or not you are serving customers or exploiting them. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. So uh, we have some time for, for questions, if you'll, t if you'll take them. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to. So um, while uh, our audience thinks up uh, what question they should ask, uh, I want to ask you one. Sure. What's the last thing that you repaired yourself? <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest with you. I am not a handy man. Um, my father was not a handy man. <laughs> His father before him was not a handyman, so we, we don't have that, uh, that, uh, those genes. Um, uh, that, that's fair. There was a time, though, there was a time, it's a long time ago, it's probably 20 years ago, where I was, I was fairly handy with a soldering iron. I could actually solder some wires. I was in the music business for a while, and so, you know, microphones would break and, and things like that, and I could actually solder those cables, but that was, those are atrophied muscles at this point. So, so any, anybody here who, uh, who wants to talk about the last thing that they fixed or actually have a, a real question? <laughs> somebody in the back. I'm not going to throw it that far. It's going to hit somebody else in the face. So I'm just going to run over to you and throw it from here. You've got it. I, I just wanted a point of clarification, and that sure. was the attitude of John Deere yeah. to uh, the way farmers were solving their problem, because that was slightly unclear for me. Is John Deere basically mm. closing their eyes and saying, fine, get on with it? Or is John Deere have a problem is trying to find a way to stop that happening? What, what's John Deere's attitude? Currently, it's uh, suboptimal, their reaction. It's very legal. Uh, it's, it's, it, 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 there's no... They're not necessarily appealing to the farmers as, you know, we've been working with you for 100 years, let us figure out how to solve this with you. It's more like, you signed the license agreement, this is what you signed up for, sorry. Right, generally speaking, and, and there's copies of, of these legal proceedings online and the kind of um, conversations that they're currently having with their target audience. And it's not great. 
In fact, it's, it's not good at all. Um, they could certainly be trying to open up the lines of communication a bit more and try to understand why this is happening and how to work around it, right? For example, like one thing they could do is to say, look, what are the top five things that farmers fix on every tractor? They know this, the things are wired, right? They've been wired and with sensors for years, right? What, is a, what are the top five things? Let me grant a farmer access to fix those five things that happen 90% of the time. Right? But that challenges the services revenue, the services business model, right? And so that's, that's, where, that's where they're playing right now. And it's not great. Does that answer your question? Uh, it that, does. It sounds familiar. Thank you very much. Any more, any more questions? Don't be shy. It's okay. You can ask a question. It can even be unrelated. Here we go. Catch. So does John Deere know you're giving this talk? They do. Uh, they do. In fact, um, we interviewed them for this talk, and they've seen video of it. Um, and in fact, we actually had some contact with them this week and uh, learned some new things. It was a little late. Um, I don't have the full debrief on it yet, but we learned some new things to, to integrate in this conversation. But they do know it. Um, look, th their point of view is that this is an edge case, right? This, this is an extreme, and their point of view is an extreme edge case. Right, and so in that, in, the, in that sense, they don't necessarily want to fix it. Again, how much of an edge case is it? How often does it happen? We don't know. Like, there, there's a there's a whole series of um, investigative journalism articles and videos about this that Vice magazine did, Motherboard and Vice did for this. There's, there's 10, 11 minute videos online where they talk to farmer after farmer after farmer that's run into this exact situation. Um, so how much of an edge case is it? I don't know. How much it conflicts with their services, revenue, business model? I don't know. But they do know that we're, that we're, that we're talking about this so far. Because I, I definitely wanted to get their point of view into this, right? And, and to be perfectly fair, they do amazing work, right? The, the products and services that they're building are absolutely amazing. The level of technology in these, these devices is unfathomable, right? They, they do, they, they do A-B testing on farmland, right? I'm not even joking. They do one meter by one meter A-B tests, and they'll do nine of them with a different combination of seed and fertilizer and whatever, and they'll collect the data and then send that data back to the farmer, and the machines just kind of go off and then take the best outcome and deployed in the field, right? They do that kind of stuff. It's amazing work, right? It's just kind of running into business model innovation challenges. Yeah. Go on up front. Um, you showed your model where you showed sense in relation to the response. Yeah. That model, and I will buy the book. Yes. I'll read it myself. But the question now is, how much does that differ from the lean startup methodology? How much does it differ? Yeah, or is um, it different? It doesn't, it doesn't differ at all. It doesn't differ at all. I think the most important thing, perhaps, perhaps the, 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 the implication is, is the respond piece of it, right? Getting ideas in the market and seeing how they affect customer behavior is, is build and measure, right? Uh, build, perhaps build, measure, and learn, right? Perhaps the, 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 the biggest difference, if I was to call out a difference, is, is the respond piece. One of the things that generally seems to be a problem. So if you're lucky enough to work in an organization that runs experiments, that's terrific. If you're lucky enough in, to run an organization that runs experiments and learns from those experiments, that's also terrific. The biggest challenge that I see with the people that I work with, the clients that I work with, and the teams that I work with, is that they get lucky enough to run experiments and to learn from those experiments, but then they come up to their boss is their business line stakeholders, and they say, hey, we learned this thing, and uh, the project that we're working on or the initiative is bad, right? It's, it's, it's bad, it's the wrong business model. This is what we're seeing, hacked Ukrainian code. And then the business is like, yeah, yeah, that's great, but we made some promises to Wall Street, so we're shipping that thing anyway. So the respond piece of it is really the biggest challenge, the cultural challenge, right? There was a reason why in that slide, respond was orange, right? Because for shipping quickly and regularly, you can invest money in that, in continuous deployment, in experimentation, um, et cetera. For sensing, you can invest money in that, in analytics and in qualitative research to understand what and why people are doing certain things with your product. But actually acting on that information is a cultural change. Right? Having an organization that says, you know what, yeah, that's a bad idea, we need to do something else, is a very, very difficult thing to build into most organizational cultures. Because being wrong, what it is, is you're explicitly admitting that you were wrong. And being wrong in many companies is very risky. Right? Or at least admitting that you were wrong. Right? So that, I think that's the biggest, the biggest difference. Yeah. 
So any more questions? I actually have a question. Uh, after doing, uh, doing this research, do you uh, believe that all code should be open sourced? Uh, I, I don't know that I believe that. What I do believe, uh, and, and I don't really know what that means, right, uh, or what the implications of that are, but, but, the, uh, but, but what I believe is that there needs to be a balance, right? You, like I said, and this is just one example, right? But this, this is happening. You've seen this with Keurig machines. You've seen this with iPhones. Like people want to fix their thing, or they want to hack it, or they want to do something else with it just because you, you know, glued it together and made the code copyright protected. Um, and, I, and I get that, right? John Deere, for example, has invested millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in creating this amazing technology, and they don't want you to mess it up. Right? And they don't want you to share it, that type of thing. Terrific. I get that. Right? But if there are three or four things that satisfy 99% of these edge cases, right? Give me access to that. Find that middle ground. Look for it. Because the evidence is clear. The evidence is that there are situations where this is conflicting uh, with culture and the way that, that our farmers want to work. And so I, th I think that there's a middle ground where you can protect your IP, right? reap the benefits of those investments, and still create a great customer experience. Very cool. Yep. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right.